Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the great sources of anxiety for many adults even those who are in a situation of relative affluence. And it's also a worry for many children who are you know, concerned with these, these sorts of things in terms of you know, their situation and their parents, is this question, what am I going to do? How am I going to get by? How will I put food on the table? How will I keep a roof over our head? Uh, and many people are in, in situations where this you know, does seem to them to be something that they ought to be worried about, uh, in part because they are, in fact, in a situation of what we call insecurity. The question that Epictetus wants us to grapple with, and he's going to give us a very good discussion of this in, in uh, chapter 26 of book 3, is whether this insecurity ought to be a source of anxiety, agonia, there's a whole video on that, by the way, if you want, or fear for us or whether we should approach these matters with a kind of confidence. And he's not going to just say, hey, buck up, you know, uh, don't worry about it, keep it out of your mind. He, he's, he's doing something very helpful for us in this chapter, which is leading the person who is concerned with these things through a reasoning process so that they can reflect and see that these fears are actually irrational, that they don't have to be so concerned about uh, the possibility of, of starvation or poverty or illness. Um, why not? Well, as it turns out, and this is where he's going to be particularly helpful, I think, he's going to show us that the fears that we think are what are really bothering us are just surface level, and that if we probe a little bit, we see that we have other fears that are coming to light, which are equally irrational, and those are providing the basis for this expression of this fear. So um, he starts out by, by talking about this state of aporia. Aporia in, in Greek uh, can mean you know, being stuck in uh, a path and you can't find your way through anymore. Like when you go into a forest and the path ends and now you're like, oh, where do we go, right? You can retrace your path, but you can't get through. It can also mean a sort of um, puzzlement, a, a, a situation where you can't figure things out. When we talk about Plato's operatic dialogues as being the ones where they start out trying to figure out what virtue is and they don't arrive at an answer, that's that kind of operia. But it can also mean a lack of resources, a, a situation where one doesn't have what one needs. And it's also connected with this notion of endeia in Greek, another way of translating that, to be stuck in, in want or need or necessity. But they're all circling around this issue of how am I going to get by? And so Epictetus says, um, think about other, other people's cases. Think about a runaway slave. When they leave their masters, um, don't they steal a little bit to last them for the first few days, then afterwards drift along land and sea, contriving one scheme after another to keep themselves fed? And what runaway slave ever died of hunger? But you're, you're not in that situation. You actually have resources. You have an income. You have property. You have this and that. Uh, you, and, and you're worried about starving. These people don't starve. He talks about beggars as well, and he says, you know, you see a lot of old beggars, don't you? How do they live to such an old age if they're, you know, constantly exposed to the kinds of dangers that you're imagining to be the case? And he says, you tremble and lie awake at night for fear the necessities of life will fail you. And he says, wretch, are you so blind and do you fail to see the road to which the lack of necessities of life leads? And where is it? That? Well, that's death. 
And for the Stoics, death is not something that we ought to regard as terrible. I mean, there are going to be situations in which, um, you know, once we get stuck in them, that's the way it's going to end. And we don't necessarily control whether that's going to happen or not. What we do control is how we think about it and how we react to it. Do we die as somebody who, you know, uh, is, is constantly worried about the, the oncoming end? Or do we approach it with a kind of uh, confidence and serenity? He goes on and he says, um, you know, what you're really worried about is not that sort of thing. What you're really worried about is the fear behind this fear. That's the way I'm calling it. That's not his own words. Uh, which is social disgrace. And he's using this term, to um, We, we uh, contrast that to to kalon, meaning the beautiful or the fine or the noble. To eiskron means something like the disgraceful, the shameful, the ugly. And he uses it in a number of different cognates. Uh, you know, so he's using it in a noun, verb, adjective. But he talks quite a bit about this. And he says, this is what you're really worried about. You're not so worried about starving. You're worried about what other people are going to think of you by the fact that you have to go out and find some other way to make a living, to put food on the table. He says, um, here we go. Can't you draw water or write or escort boys to and from school or be another's doorkeeper? These are seen as somewhat menial professions in his own context. Um, to draw water. That's something that Cleanthes, one of the uh, rulers, the scholarch, the second scholarch of the school, used to do. That was his day job. And then at night he would go to Epictetus, or he'd go to um, Zeno's school and study. So if it was good enough for Cleanthes, the ruler of the school, why is it such a hardship for us? Um, you know, you can think about uh, St. Paul in, in Christian terms and the fact that he was a tent maker. That was not a particularly, you know, high class position. That was, you know, working with your hands and mending tents and doing that sort of thing. You can be a stoic as uh, a cook. You don't need to be the executive chef. You can just, you know, be the cook or the dishwasher and you can get by. Um, you can babysit. You know, when he's talking about escorting boys to and from school, that's like what a nanny does or, or somebody along those lines. Um, being a doorkeeper. And then he says, this is what the person would say, it's disgraceful to come to such a necessity. Now, here's where it gets very interesting. We should ask ourselves, well, why is that disgraceful? Is it disgraceful in and of itself? Well, then why are those other people doing it? Why are you allowing somebody to be your doorkeeper if it's such a disgraceful thing? Is it disgraceful just for you? Because you at one time were higher than that? That's where the real fear lies. In having other people say, wow, that guy used to be somebody, and now he's just like the rest of us, or he's nobody. This is a great fear that, that people actually feel. And Ep Epictetus is going to say, is that really something disgraceful? To start, start uh, delivering pizzas, or to start babysitting, or to you know, have to cold call clients, or any of these sorts of things that are part of the fabric of so many other people's lives. To take, imagine taking a position as a janitor in a cleaning service. Is that, is that so terrible if, if it brings in an income and allows you to meet the necessities that you have? So he says what we need to do is think about what really is disgraceful. He says, um, is anything disgraceful to you which is not your own doing, for which you are not responsible, which has befallen you accidentally, like a headache or a fever? Is it disgraceful for you to, to get sick, to have the flu, to have a cold? No, you call in sick and you say, I'm, I'm sick today. The boss doesn't say, oh, shame, shame, how far you have fallen. Right? They just give you a sick day. Uh, he says, if your parents were poor, or if they were rich but left others as their heirs, and if they gave you no help though they are living, is this disgraceful to you? You might say, well, look, other people are going to look at it, and they're going to say, your, your parents didn't help you. There must be something wrong with you. Epictetus would say, that's up to them. 
You don't control their misinterpretations of the situation. You control how you understand and regard the situation. If you didn't have any role in it, there is nothing disgraceful about the situation for you. He says, um, have you never heard that the disgraceful thing is censurable or criticizable, and the censurable is that which deserves censure? And whom do you censure for what is not his own doing, which he didn't produce himself? Well, did you produce this situation? Did you make your father what he is? Or is it in your power to reform him? So Epictetus says, shouldn't you wish then for what is not, uh, should you wish for what is not given you, or to be ashamed when you fail to get it? Why are you studying philosophy then? The whole point of, of studying Stoic philosophy is so that we can learn to distinguish what actually is our responsibility, what's in our power, what we have control over, and that whole host of things that, sure, other people care about, and we find ourselves tempted to give a lot of care to, but it isn't our business at all. And so if we can look at things in the proper light, we're going to realize that that fear about, well, what are people going to think? is an irrational fear. And the worry about how am I going to get by really translates in many cases to what are people going to think of me if I have to take that dishwashing job? Or if I have to quit school? Or if I have to um, trade in the car for you know some older car that isn't going to cost so much? All these sorts of things. Uh, another fear that he talks about as behind this is one that some other people face. And this he actually has some very funny things to say about this. Um, he says, you fear hunger as you fancy, but it's not hunger you fear, but you're afraid you will not have a professional cook. You will not have a, another servant to buy the delicacies, another to put on your shoes for you, another to dress you others to give you your massage, others to follow at your heels in order that when you have undressed in a bath and stretched yourself out like men who have been crucified, you may be massaged on this side and that, and that then the masseur may stand over you and say, move over, give me his side, you take his head, hand me his shoulder, and then when you've left the bath and gone home that you may shout out, is no one bringing me something to eat? And after that, clear away the tables, wipe them off with a sponge. What you are afraid of is this, he says that you may not be able to live the life of the invalid. The life of luxury is actually a life of an invalid. It's somebody who needs other people to take care of all their things. And this could be a real fear. I mean, if you think about the fact that we use money as, as an exchange to get us all the things that we need, and you know, we, we buy goods and services from people, um, once we start making our way up into um, you know, higher income, having more property, stuff like that, it becomes very easy to start indulging ourselves in all sorts of things where we, we pay other people to do these things for us. And then we can become dependent upon them, or at least think of ourselves dependent upon them, and worry very much about if it, what, what if that gets taken away? What if I don't get the Christmas bonus this year, and I don't have enough to cover all of these presents that I'm going to buy, and also pay for this and this and this and this and this, which I need. Epictetus would say, those are necessities. You, you don't need that much in order to, to live and live well. So how can we look at these matters? He actually gives us two pieces of, of practical advice besides the analysis that he's carried out here of thinking, well, what are you really afraid of, and is that a rational thing to be afraid of? He talks in religious terms about God providing us what we need. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, if you're uh, sick and you're in your apartment somewhere, that, you know, you pray to God and suddenly the medicine comes floating down from heaven or things like that. I mean, you can still die, but... The question is what, is, what is, what are we provided with? We are provided with our rational faculty and our faculty of choice, which we determine how we're going to use. How do we face our situations? Things are not as bad as we tend to see them when we start worrying about this sort of thing. We have the resources that we need in order to meet the, the challenges that face us. The other thing that he says is that we should live like a healthy person. Here he talks about living, uh, and he's speaking from experience, by the way, uh, like, like workers, people who have to actually work with their hands, 
and genuine philosophers. Here he's thinking about somebody like Cleanthes. Um, he also talks about living like slaves. He doesn't mean that we should try to find somebody else to rule over us. He means that we can live and live well without having to worry about lots and lots of possessions, lots and lots of things that fall out of our control. Um, we can, in fact, live the way that, that you know, the Stoic sages did, the way that Hercules did, the way that Odysseus, he talks about all these different people. Uh, that is a possibility for us. But it's one that we actually have to choose. And if we do choose it and follow through on it, we're not going to be plagued by these irrational fears.